All but the wealthiest families sew their own clothes. It takes many hours of work to sew the entire family's wardrobe, so we usually have only two sets of work clothes and maybe a third set used only on special occasions. Since clothes are not easily replaced, we keep them in a functioning condition for as long as possible by mending them often. We buy children's shoes oversized and stuff them with rags while the child grows into them. We might also sew a rag doll. Laundry was usually done on Monday after Sunday's rest. We first boil clothing in a large pot, chop a lot of firewood to keep the water boiling, use a big stick to pull clothing from the boiling water, and then scrub and pound the clothing in tubs. Two hundred years ago, each item had to be scrubbed for several minutes just to remove dirt, making this into a day-long chore. After the laundry was done, Mom made the family's meal from scratch. The time-consuming laundry task had to be done once every week throughout the year, even when the weather was cold enough to freeze water. One day when the temperature was 20 degrees below zero, a girl wrote in her diary, It is the coldest day I have ever known. Mother is doing the laundry. Harriet Beecher Stowe said that this day-long chore resulted in bleached, parboiled fingers. Clothing is hung on a clothesline if the family has one, otherwise clothes are thrown on the bushes to dry. During rainy weather, clothes take one week to dry indoors. Woman's work involved everything inside the home. Certain chores are done seasonally, including soap and candle making, sheep shearing, spring cleaning, and fall cleaning. Rooms cannot be washed in the winter because the resulting ice would remain indoors until the spring thaw. Women's work was less varied through the seasons than was that of men, but was more varied through the day. Women were usually trying to do four things at once, all while tending to the children. Throughout a 15-year time span, a housewife was either pregnant or nursing, as she typically had seven births. In a procedure now outlawed, goose feathers are plucked every few months by first putting a stocking over the head of a goose. Its quill feathers are pulled just once and used as riding pins. Girls were taught to knit as soon as they could hold needles. A four-year-old might knit stockings. Soon she could knit a purse or a bag that was used for storing things, just as did the Wampanoag. Or she may knit poetry-laden middens and be finished in time to help make dinner. Boys had to knit their own suspenders. A girl began by stitching a sampler. When I was young and in my prime, you see how well I spent my time. And by my sampler you may see what care my parents took of me. 3.1415 and sometimes Y and Z. Women of the neighborhood met for quilting bees that might last one week. They discussed details and techniques including dove in the window, Rose of Sharon and Chinese Puzzle. The finished quilt adorns a person's bed and embodies the work and skill of the neighborhood. Urban women had much the same chores as had rural women. But those of us poor urban women struggled ever harder to scratch out a living. The most leisured women were those who presided over a wealthy home. She might have only to make pastries between social visits while her living help prepared and served meals. She might also choose to wash the delicate china cups herself. Her day was less wearing than for the vast majority of women in the United States. The work of us men involved the barn, gates, fields, pastures, and woodlands. 
It included such things as cleaning cow stalls, maintaining gates and fences, and working the crops. During the cold northern winters, there was no work to do in the fields. We then chopped wood, repaired harnesses, and took long social visits. Superstitions guided many aspects of the daily actions of ancient Mesopotamians, medieval, and Canela people, and New England farmers too. If one family in the community had trouble with illness, cattle, or butter or cheese making and such, then accusations of witchcraft might occur to explain why they were singled out. Such accusations occurred in the U.S. until the 20th century. Astrology guided the timing of numerous activities, including the weaning of a calf or the weaning of our own baby. We would wait to do certain chore until a proper sign of the zodiac. We would plant certain crops only during certain phases of the moon. For example, the December hog slaughter had to avoid a waning moon or it was feared that the pork would wither and shrink in the barrel. Why do you suppose our grandparents would do things this way? They would answer, because it has always been so. As we began working in factories, the owners required us to work during set hours. Astrology then began to play less of a role in our daily activities. Remember that while today's science and technology produce countless devices that make life easier, Astrology has never built one machine or made one improvement. Astrology is nonsense. For entertainment and socializing, many of us men drank heavily at the town's tavern. The per capita rate of consumption of alcohol was triple today's rate. Some cities had one tavern for every 80 persons. Women drank in small amounts and were rarely seen drinking in a tavern. The temperance advocates of the 1820s estimated that men drank 15 times as much as did women. Men drank heavily at every event in the community, including barn raisings, hay cutting, stump pullings, log pullings, rock clearings, apple paring bees, corn husking bees, and weddings. The temperance movement that began in the 1820s cut alcohol consumption by two-thirds in 20 years. Horace Greeley said that the reduction in drinking represented a great change in public sentiment. More recently, we have seen changes in public sentiment about littering and about drunk driving. Entertainment also consisted of various forms of gambling. Card and dice games were common and many towns had a horse race route on the outskirts of town. Bets were also placed on bloody fights between pairs of about any type of animals, including roosters, dogs, dogs and chain bulls, or dogs and bears. Eventually, we decided this was just pointless brutality. The women of the community gathered for many activities, including quilting parties and apple pairings. While removing apple pills, a young girl would look for those that spelled the initials of her future husband. When young women met for a quilting party, it would be followed by the arrival of young men who would shout hurries from outside the home while waiting for the after quilting dance. A young man, not yet of courting age, would play a fiddle while everyone danced, typically until 3 a.m. unless a contest was called to see who could dance the longest. The fiddle was brought to the U.S. by the peoples of every European region. In the year 1800, the people of the U.S. were dancing to the same jigs and reels as were the people of Ireland, England, and Scotland. We sang songs that were already centuries old. For example, the long popular Chevy Chase ballad had roots in a 14th century Scottish border battle. 
Until about 1800, the dancing fashion was the contra dance, in which women and men formed opposing lines while each couple moved in predetermined patterns. Around 1800, a new four couple dance arrived from France and would continue in time as the more recent square dance. Young people took right to it and complained when older people insisted on doing the older line dances. Some of these younger people would then do the contra dance wrong on purpose despite their elders. The next dancing fashion to arrive from Paris was that of the waltz of 1821 that had individual pairs moving about as they pleased in an intimate face-to-face -face embrace. Each new dancing or clothing fashion would have first arrive in the large port cities and through the next few years, slowly move outwards into the rural countryside. Even later, each would eventually make their way to the western frontier. Every social event was also an occasion for courting, and couples acted with a freedom that surprises today's more restrained age. For example, couples were allowed to sleep in the same bed together but only a fully clothed and separated by a board or wrapped in separate cloth sacks or bundling bags. This is not at all that surprising since family members, hired help, and traveling strangers were sharing beds all over the country for warmth's sake. While working or socializing, we would discuss the world. One day, Francis Underwood recorded the sequence of topics at a social gathering. First, measles and whooping cough were discussed, then a reported bear sighting, followed by discussions of absent neighbors and the marriage prospects of some neighborhood youngsters. They then discussed the rumor of how the clock of a deceased man hadn't run for years but struck 44 times, which was his age at the moment he died. One day in January 1804, 19-year-old Zelota Barrett of New Hartford, Connecticut was writing in her diary when she decided to list the subjects of her parents' conversation with their neighbors. These were the farm animals, President Jefferson and the Democrats' defeat of the Federalist, the terms of a local property dispute, a woman's sore finger, a colonel's promotion to general in the state militia, and a heated discussion about assigning seating arrangements for families in the Congregational Meeting House. There were many social visits. Mary White kept a 30-year diary in which she recorded her social visits. During a typical week, she would have 10 visitors at her home and she would visit three or four others. In 1835, unmarried Pamela Brown of Plymouth, Vermont kept a diary. She went to every funeral in Plymouth and often set up with the neighborhood sick. Four or five times per week she went to visit a friend's house or had them visiting at her own house. These visits will often last for two or three days. She also went to visit nearby relatives in other towns. After harvest she went to weekly dances, singing schools and quilting parties, all without adult supervision. In 1824, the recent mother Anne Jean Lyman said that the conflicting claims of society and children made her curtail her visiting. Visiting was less frequent during the busier agricultural months and the cold winter months. The country store was also a place for meeting and gossiping. There would be talk about livestock and produce, sickness and health, birth and marriages. In the cities, neighbors would visit each other's homes several times per day. Wealthy urbanites developed an increasingly complicated etiquette determining how often one person or family should visit another and who should visit whom. The rules involved kinship, business, and politics. They were burying themselves behind a system of exclusion as rigorous as that of aristocratic England but without the guards and knights. Social events and work included much singing. European travelers said that those of us who were slaves had good voices, sang in tune, 
and had a rich and distinctive musical style that revealed both the highest joy and the deepest sadness. We slaves all join in rather than having just one person perform solo in front of a silent audience as occurs in European performances. For centuries, the church singing of Europeans lacked in tone and synchronization. Between 1770 and 1820, talented groups went around the U.S. training a portion of each congregation to comprise a church choir, who in turn led the rest of us with their more proper singing. Some churches had one lead who would sing out a sentence alone that was then repeated by the entire congregation. Organs were added to help direct the members. Some church leaders would sing out Fa Salah to help direct the group in a style that lives on in the sacred harp singing of the South. The neighborhood met each Sunday at the town church. The church building was shared by several sects who took turn using it, and it was also the town meeting house. In the colder north, wine might freeze in the unheated building during service. We brought our family pets and let them roam around the building during the sermon. Chickens and turkeys would walk through the building and might even roost on the pulpit. On Sunday, some families put all toys away, may have forbid play and laughter, and then conducted religious readings. Some described Sunday as a peaceful day, while others said it was busy. The unchurched would lounge on Sunday or drink heavily with neighbors. Both the original purpose and manifestations of our social genes are demonstrated as the community pools efforts on chores deemed larger than one person can do alone, including such things as hay, stump, log, rock, snow, apples, corn, and barn raising. A large field is best cut and harvested on a singularly appropriate day. The help of many persons from the community is beneficial in accomplishing this chore and to do it in one day. The neighboring families combine efforts and the nearby town is emptied as its merchants close shop to join in the project. Haying is handled with the excitement of a battle. Lines of people with long handled cysts work across the field. A slow cutter would, would receive friendly insults. Young men consider hang to be a physical challenge and a contest and strive to be considered the best mower or to be assigned head of a group. This work lasted 14 to 16 hours through the long summer day from dawn until dusk and even later during the bright light of a full moon. Cutting hay required the most work of all. Potatoes, oats, rye, corn, and wheat were harvested later in the year and did not require such a frantic rush as did haying. Threshing grain was done in the 10,000 year old labor intensive fashion. Since cotton was hard to pick, only the most dexterous avoided cuts and bleeding fingers and hands. While picking cotton, those of us who were slaves were driven, sometimes to exhaustion, by the threat of the ever present whip. Harvested corn is stacked into a number of high piles. Neighboring families come to help remove the corn husk from each ear. Groups were assigned to each pile and then races would occur. Finding a lucky red ear meant pending courtship. Shucking corn was an occasion for celebration and every celebration involved heavy drinking and dancing. Alice Earle explains that after a heavy snow, community members used oxen-powered plows to push the snow off the roads. Everyone joined in to clear the roads because everyone needed to go to the school, church, post office, and town and be able to make social visits. Plowing began with those living farthest out of town. As they traveled inward, they were joined by others and their oxen. A tired ox would be left in someone's barn to be retrieved later. All raced toward the center of town where roads converged. There would be dozens of oxen and sleighs 
parked at the tavern. We still have to go in that Toboggans were first used by Native Americans to transport heavy loads across the snow. Community members would walk as far as 10 miles to meet at a homestead that needed trees to be cut down or needed rocks to be cleared from a field. Cut trees are left to dry for several months before everyone gathers again to drag away and pile up the logs. Accidents and injuries might occur while working as men would drink much rum. Everyone helped, including the Supreme Court Justice who lived in the area. Neighbors also worked the crop field of a sick person. People would meet to raise up a building, which might be a barn, church, or a school. They might break a bottle of rum over the central ridge pole. While we observe this modern day barn raising by an Amish community, we'll discuss the aspect of human nature that is the exchange of mutual assistance. We see that a few days help in harvesting might be traded for help in spinning thread, shucking corn, peeling apples, or tailoring a shirt. Some firewood or meat might be traded for the loan of a horse or wagon, or maybe for a few weeks' pasturing of a cow. Neighboring families exchanged goods, utensils, and the help of themselves and their children. No money was paid in these help exchanges, but mental balances were kept. Neighbors exchanged help in doing many chores, but especially in those that were large or had to be done so quickly, such as in cutting the hay field. Soon after new families moved into a New England community, they were quickly entangled in the local system of exchanging goods and help. Everyone gave and received strength, time, and goodwill. The community was a social contract. These agricultural examples of mutual aid among neighbors is similar to those of other times and places. We saw that a group of Yoruba farming families might work one farmland at a time, and that medieval European villagers might work the entire crop field as a community.